Here is the IPv4 packet format, and here is our Ethernet frame from, that we decoded in the prior slide. So we have the destination MAC, we have the source MAC, we have the type field, we know it as IP version 4, our IP version 4 data starts here. The first four bits of the IPv4 packet format are the version number. And you can see actually the next four bits here is a four. So that's a good confirmation that this is an IP version 4 packet. And you'll find that reassuring. If we, the next thing we, we're going to go into detail in the IPv4 packet format later in this course. We're going to spend an entire class on it. But I want to point out a couple other important things. One of them is the protocol. So the protocol, we have an offset. It is each of these, this is 32 bits across. So this is four bytes across or four octets across. So four, eight, we skip nine. We, 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 so offset octet eight is here. Offset octet nine is here. These eight bits are the protocol. So if we, if we skip forward, that number nine, um, nine octets, which is 18 hexadecimal characters, we get to the, the zero six and the zero six are these eight bits here. And that is the protocol number. And that is the layer four protocol and transport protocol. Transport protocol six is TCP, the transmission control protocol. So just as an ethernet frame encapsulated an IPv4 packet, the IPv4 packet encapsulates a, 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 a transport layer or TCP data. Then we, we skip another two octets, which are header checksum, and we get to a source IP version four address. The source IP version four address is 32 bits. C0, A8, 0, 0, 1, 0. And then the destination IPv4 address is, and this is also in hexadecimal, C0, A8, 0, 0, 0, A. And if you convert each octet, you know, this is a two-digit hexadecimal number, it's eight bits. If you convert that into, into decimal, then you'll get the IPv4 address, you'll get a recognizable IPv4 address in the format that you, that you recognize. So this would end with the .0.16, um, uh, uh, C, C0, I believe, is uh, 192. Uh, good guess, A8 is uh, 192.168.0.16, 192.168.0.10. So this IPv4 packet is going from 192.168.0.16 to 192.168.0.10. Key message here, IPv4 packets have 32-bit addresses. And that's, this is the, the header, and then you'll, you'll have optional options, and then after that will come the, the data, which is, uh, uh, you know, which will be TCP in this case, because our protocol was six, which is TCP. Here's that IPv4, one of the IPv4 addresses we had in our packet header in the last, uh, uh, in the last line, C0, A8, 0, 0, 1, 0. And uh, in this case, I decided to convert it to binary. C is 12, so we have the eight bit and the four bit, so one, one, zero, zero. Uh, and then of course the zero is all zeros. A is 10, so we, we set the 8-bit, we set the 2-bit, so 1010, 10, uh, and then 8, we set the 8-bit and none of the other bits, and then 0, 0, we got a whole bunch of zeros, and we got a 1 here, and then we've got all our zeros, and then we take those bits and we put them together. This line is just this line, except the we've taken, we've grouped our bits into groups of 8 and put a dot between them and or we've or you could do it c0.88.00.10 if we convert them into into decimal c well the zero is the ones digit in hexadecimal so we add zero 
And then the C is 12, but it's the 16th digit. So 12 times 16 is 192. Here we have A8. Our ones digit in hexa, our ones digit is 8, and then A is 10 in decimal. So, and this is the 16th place. So 10 times 16 plus 8 is 168. 0 is 0 times 16 plus 0. 1 0 in hex is 1 times 16 plus 0. So we have 192.168.0.16. And that's our IPv4 address in that you, you know and love, and I'm sure you recognize it. Each of these octets, you know, since it's 8 bits, it, it's a value that can range from 0 to 255. So whenever, in order to have a valid IPv4 address, each of the octets needs to be a value between 0 and 255. So this is an IPv4 address in hexadecimal format. This is an IPv4 address in binary format. And this is the same IPv4 address in dotted decimal notation. So IPv4 addresses have 32 bits. So that means that there are two to the 32nd power possible IPv4 addresses. Approximately how many is that? Well, two to the 10th is a thousand. So two to the 20th is a million. So two to the 30th is approximately a billion. So that two to the 32nd is four times that. So approximately 4.2 billion possible IPv4 addresses. And not even all of them are usable. On the internet, in order to talk to somebody on the inter else on the internet, you need to have, you need to have unique source and destination IPv4 addresses. Otherwise, the core of the internet wouldn't be able to forward the traffic properly. So, you know, how many IPv4 addresses do you use? You have your laptop, you have your phone, your phone might have a wireless interface, uh, a Wi-Fi interface, your phone might have a cellular interface, your, uh, uh, you, you might have uh, or you, know, you might have a, a camera at home, you might have a, a Wi-Fi thermostat at home, uh, you know, you might have a desktop computer. If there are, the, the planet's population is between seven and eight billion people, and there's only four billion, you know, 4.2 billion unique IBV4 addresses. The, the world is out of IPv4 addresses. There are central, reg each, there are central registries that allocate IPv4 addresses to companies and to internet service providers. And those central registries have been out of IPv4 addresses for years. There's currently a bidding war for IPv4 addresses between cloud service providers. The current value of an internet routable IPv4 address is $50. So, you know, people are talking about cryptocurrency and, you know, hey, I've got something that's sort of like a prime number and it's worth money. You know, why don't you buy it off me? Well, guess what? Unique IPv4 addresses are, are they're a finite resource, there's a shortage, and they're valuable and the price is going up. Let's do another manual frame decode. So here we have an Ethernet frame. The, the, the preamble's already ripped off, so this is as seen by the host. The destination MAC address is the first six bytes, which is the first 12 hexadecimal characters. So 685B3589A04. And then the source MAC address is the next six bytes, the next 12 hexadecimal characters, B07FB95D8ED2. And then we have the type or the length field is the next two bytes, so the next four hexadecimal characters, what is that? 86DD. That's large enough, so this is Ethernet 2, that's because it's greater than 1500 decimal, greater than 05DC hexadecimal. So we look up 86DD in our ether type number table, and we see that 86DD is IP version 6. Here's the solution from our previous slide, color coded. And you can see the destination MAC address, the uh, uh, first 12 hexadecimal characters, 
the source MAC address, the next 12 hexadecimal characters, and then the type field of 86DD, uh, the next four hexadecimal characters, indicating that this frame encapsulates an IP version 6 packet. Here is the format for the IPv6 packet header. It is 40 bytes total. Each row is 32 bits, numbered 0 to 31, so four bytes or four octets across. So we have four octets for the version, traffic class, and flow label, four octets for the payload length, next header, and hop limit, and then we have four rows of source address. So that's 16 bytes of source address and 16 bytes of destination address. You can see overall the IPv6 packet header is simpler than the IP version 4 packet header. It's doubled the size from, from the, the, the minimum IPv4 packet header size is 20 bytes. We've doubled it from 20 bytes to 40 bytes for IP version 6. However, our addresses have quadrupled in size from, from 32 bits to 128 bits. Let's do a manual frame decode on our IP version 6 header. The, the Ethernet frame ended here with the 86DD, and that is where the IP version 6 packet began. The first four bits in the header is the version number, and you can see the first four bits here correspond to the hexadecimal digit 6. So that is reassuring that we have successfully re we successfully identified the end of the frame header and the beginning of the IPv6 packet header. Uh, and then we, uh, from the beginning, we if we pass skip four, five, six octets, we get to something called the next header field. So um, from here, that's six octets. That's twelve hexadecimal characters. So so two, four, eight. I'm sorry, two, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. The next header field is zero six. In this case, the next header field is indicating the the transport layer protocol. Zero six also means TCP. So one other interesting thing about IPv4 and IP version six, they might be different layer three protocols but they can both encapsulate the same layer four protocol TCP. And that will be important to us later when we're talking about the migration from IP version four to IP version six. And then we skip eight more bits, which is the hop limit, and we get to the source address. So the source address is 2600-1406-1400-049C, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 3, 1, 3. That is 16 bytes, so it's 32 hexadecimal digits. I, I normally won't read IPv6 addresses out in, all, in their entirety, but I wanted to do it this time so you can get a feel for the length. In one sense, it's big and long and intimidating. And in another sense, all it is is 128 bits, 16 bytes, 32 hexadecimal characters. And then the destination address is just the next 16 bytes, the next 128 bits, the next 32 hexadecimal characters. And that brings us to the end of the IPv6 packet header, and then we interpret the rest of the information according to the next header field. Again, the next header field was six, which means that we interpret start the, zero, the data starting with zero one as a TCP segment, which we'll get to later. So that is an IPv6 packet header. It has a source address and it has a destination address, just like IPv4, and it looks scary, but it's just 128 bits. And the, the header itself is actually simpler than the IPv4 header. We will spend an entire class later going over the IPv6 header in detail. How many IPv6 addresses are there? Well, it's 2 to the 128th power. And sure, we could plug that into a calculator, a, a, a special calculator, a computer calculator, but what fun would that be? So let's estimate it. So it's 2 to the 32nd power 
times 2 to the 32nd power times 2 to the 32nd power times 2 to the 32nd power. So it's approximately 4 billion times 4 billion times 4 billion times 4 billion or approximately 256 billion 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 IPv6 addresses. So uh, 3.4, that's also equivalent to 3 point, you know, using the calculator, that's equivalent to 3.4 times 10 to the 38th power approximately, uh, or 340 trillion 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 possible IPv6 addresses. That should be enough. So an IPv6 address is 128 bits. And the way we organize it when we're to make it easier to read is we put four hexadecimal characters corresponding to 16 bits, and then we put a colon. And so we have, this is called a hextet. It's 16 bits. And then if we have eight hextets, then we have 128 bits. So the 2001, um, you know, if you convert it, in, I, I've, I've, I've emboldened them and put the corresponding bits here. And then the DB8 is not emboldened and the corresponding 16 bits here. And then 4802, the corresponding 16 bits here and so on. So this is an IPv6 address in binary. And this is the corresponding IPv6 address in hexadecimal. So eight hextets, each consisting of 16 bits or four nibbles. However, you may have noticed there's only three hexadecimal digits there. Why is that? So IPv6 addresses, uh, they're so long that they came up with some shortening rules to make certain types of IPv6 addresses easier to read. And so there are IPv6 address shortening rules which are defined in, in a request for comment, RFC 4291. The first rule is you can remove leading zeros in each hextet, but you have to leave at least one numeral in each hextet. So in 2001, the first hextet, there are no leading zeros, so we don't shorten it. However, 0db8, we, we can remove the leading zero, and so that becomes db8 after the shortening rule. And then over here we have four zeros, we can remove the leading zeros, um, and so we remove the three leading zeros, and so that hex debt just becomes colon, zero, colon. And then the other rule is we can, in, we can replace consecutive colon, zero, colon hex tets with colon, colon, but we can only do it once per IPv6 address. And we're actually supposed to do it at the place which has the most consecutive colon, zero, colon instances. So... In this case, we have a choice. We have a one colon zero colon here. We have two colon zero colons here. So we 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 shorten this location. So this colon zero colon zero becomes colon colon. So this representation, and and we only do it once. So this other location where we just we 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 leave it as colon zero colon. This represents the same IPv6 as just this one. It's still 128 bits and we have the ability to expand it back to 128 bits. So again, the two rules, remove the leading zeros in each hextet, but leave at least one numeral in each hextet. And then once in the IPv6 address, you can remove consecutive colon zero colon hextets uh, and replace it with colon colon. Since we shortened the representation, we need to be able to lengthen the representation. So we want to get back to the exact same original thing. So our two rules are we prepend zeros in each hextet until each hextet has four digits. And then we expand the colon colon into sufficient colon zero 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 colon hextets, resulting in a total of eight hextets. So here's the example. The first rule, we prepend the zeros. So the DB8 becomes 0DB8, the 32 becomes 0032, the, the, the 0 becomes, we prepend the 300000. Um, and then the second rule, well, we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 hextets here. We know we need to have 8 when it's fully expanded, so we expand that colon colon into 2 hextets, all of zeros. Note one thing we didn't do when we shortened. 
Here's the 5BF0. We can remove leading zeros, but we cannot remove trailing zeros because if this became 5BF, then when we expand it, would we put the zero at the front or would we put the zero at the back? Well, you know, when we expand, when you expand, you put zeros at the front, so then we get a different answer. So when you're shrinking, going back to the shrinking slide, you only shrink leadings, you, you can get rid of leading zeros in a hex tet. When you're expand, and as a result, we did not get rid of the zero in the 5BF0 because it's not a leading zero in the hex tet. And then in the, then when we're expanding, you add zeros leading to get to the four hex digits in each hex tet. So I would like you to pause this video and attempt to lengthen each of these IPv6 addresses. I'll give you a couple seconds. Okay, I'm back. So for IPv6 lengthening, let's talk through this and then I'll show the results on the next slide. The first hextet is already four hex digits, so we do nothing there. The next hextet, we need to prepend one zero to get it to four digits, so zero, five, six, seven. The next hextet has two hex digits, so we need to prepend with two zeros. The next hextet has one hex digit, so we need to prepend with three zeros. And then BCDE is four digits, so no prepending. The next hextet, we have one digit, so we prepend with three zeros. The next hextet is one digit, so we prepend with three zeros. And then the next hextet is one digit, so we prepend with three zeros. We don't have any double colon instances. Just as a double check, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hextets. So that would complete the lengthening of this one. The next one, we'd prepend three zeros here. We'd prepend two zeros here. We'd prepend one zero here. Nothing to prepend here. That's the end of the prepending. And then uh, we have one, two, three, four hextets. So then we would expand the double colon with four more zero, all zero hextets. Here's an example. We don't have any prepends. I mean, we don't have any hextets with, uh, you know, with uh, fewer than four hex digits. But when we do the expansion, we have to expand it to all zeros. And this is this is a special IPv6 address. It's the 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 I mean, it's the unknown uh, IPv6 address. Uh, some in some protocols, sometimes you need to leave the IPv6 address blank so it's all zeros. That's not a valid unicast IPv6 address for actual communication. And then here's one colon colon one. Well, we'd add zero 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 one to the last text hat, and then we'd expand in front of it. So the the so we'd have seven hextets of all zero. So this this hexadecimal this IPv6 address is all zeros and then a one at the end, and it's known as colon colon one. This is the IPv6 loopback address, just as one twenty seven dot zero dot zero dot one is the IPv4 loopback address. So here we are with the solutions and. And you can you can see the expansions and in particular the all zeros address and then the the loopback address is all zeros and then a one at the end. So again, I would like you to pause the video and attempt to shorten these two IPv6 addresses using the two shortening rules. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, I'm back. Let's look at the first IPv6 address. The the first hex tet, we remove the leading three zeros. The next hex tet, we remove the leading two zeros, but do not remove the zero here. The next hex tet, we remove one leading zero. The next hex tet, there's nothing to remove. There are no leading zeros. The next hex tet will remove three leading zeros, leaving just one zero. The next hex tet will remove three leading zeros, leaving one zero. The next hex set, we remove nothing. There are no leading zeros. The next hex set, we will remove one leading zero. And then the, the next pass, the shortening, we have two hex sets, which are colon zero colon. So we can remove those two hex sets. We can remove those two hex sets and replace it with a colon colon. Next example, 2620. No leading zeros, so we do nothing there. 
0 db8 we can remove the 1 0 in the front so it's db8 four zeros here we'll remove the three leading zeros in step one four zeros here we remove the three leading zeros in step one three four one two nothing to remove four zeros remove three leading zeros four zeros remove three leading zeros four zeros remove three leading zeros okay that brings us to step two where we have two places where we have we have sequences of hextets which are all just a colon zero colon we have one sequence of two of them and one sequence of three of them so once and only once we can replace it with the double colon so and we are supposed to do it at the place which shortens it the most so we replace the three colon zero colons with the double colon and that brings us to our solutions so let's bring us back to our ifconfig-a and look more closely at our IPv6 addresses. In the first example, we have FE80, and then a colon colon, and then we have four more hextets. So in this case, we're going, to, we we have no leading, no hextets where we have to add leading zeros, but we know we're missing three hextets of all zeros. So where this double colon is, it's going to be FE80, and then we're going to have three hextets of all zeros and then we'll have the final four hextets of, of, uh, um, of addresses. And then the next one, we have one, two, three. Oh, here's a hextet with, uh, we need to add three leading zeros. Here's a hextet we need to add one leading zero and so on. We have no double colons, so just prepend uh, uh, for the IPv6 address starting with FD, we just have to do some, some individual zero prepends. And then we have uh, 2601 colon DB8. Okay, we prepend zero there. There, 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 there. No other prepends. 2601 zero DB8. We do one prepend there. And then no more prepends. And then down here we have another IPv6 address. 2601 prepend to zero DB8 and then no prepends and so on. So now when you're looking at these IPv6 addresses, you understand it looks like they're different length, but they're all representing 128 bits once you fully expand them. They're just, you know, the with the shortening rules, it just makes certain ones easier to read. In particular, the FE80, you have a lot of zeros in this one. Um, this FE, IPv6 address is starting with FE80 known as link local IPv6 addresses. And so that's not internet routable space. That's an IPv6 address, which is only useful on that specific link. And they all start with FE80, and then they 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 tend to have lots of zeros after them uh, until you get to the last four hextets. Let's talk about special IPv4 address ranges. IPv4 addresses that start with the octet zero, and, and again, remember, every IPv4 address is 32 bits. We have four octets of eight bits each. IPv4 addresses that start with octet zero are reserved and are not usable. IPv4 addresses that start with 127 are reserved for the loopback address, and in particular, 127.0.0.1 is the loopback address on most operating systems. I've occasionally seen other loopback addresses in used, used on some operating systems. For example, the other day I saw 127.0.0.53 on a system, which was a loop, which I believe was a loopback for a particular purpose. There's an RFC called RFC 1918, which has private addresses. These are addresses which are not usable on the you not not uniquely usable on the internet any site can use them you just can't route them to the internet you need to translate the ip address you have to it's called a network address translation nat which we will cover later that you you have to translate them before you can put data onto the internet so all ipv4 addresses starting with 10 are rfc 19 are private addresses all IPv6 addresses, I'm, I'm sorry, IPv4 addresses starting with 172.16 through 172.31, so everything in that range 
um, our RFC 1918 addresses. All IPv4 addresses starting with 192.168 are private addresses. And that's why at home, when you have your router, you'll find your IPv4 addresses at home. A lot of time you'll have an IP address inside 192.168 or in 10 net. And, you know, if you get on to some of the Wi-Fi nets here, you might see some IPv4 addresses in the 172.16 range. Those are private addresses. But if you're transmitted to the internet, your source IP address will be translated into a uniquely internet routable IPv4 address before you get to the core internet routers. IPv4 addresses starting with 169.254 are link local IPv4 addresses. If you plug into an ethernet switch and there is no uh, DHCP server on that switch to give you your own IPv4 address, then many operating systems will self-assign a link local IPv4 address so they can talk on that local network to other hosts on the local network with dynamically assigned link local addresses, but they can't talk to the internet. Usually if you plug, if you plug in and you see an IPv4 address starting with 169.254, that means something has gone wrong. You're not able to access the, the router. You're not, you're not able to access your DHCP server to get your address. The range of IPv4 addresses from 224 through 000 through 239, 285, 285, 285 is IPv4 multicast. That's a special type of internet protocol where you can transmit to one IPv4 address and your packets will be replicated and arrive at possibly multiple destinations. And uh, it's often you, well, there's a lot of uses for multicast. Uh, and we're going to cover that later. IPv4 addresses uh, from two, starting with 240 through 255, uh, 255, 255, 255, 254 are reserved and are not usable, which is sort of sad because there's a shortage of IPv4 addresses. If you could use this, they'd each be worth 50 bucks, but the, all the operating systems out there are already written, so um, that's too bad. And the IPv4 address 285.255.255.255 is the broadcast IPv4 address. If you ping this IPv4 address, you, depending on what type of network you are on, you may get multiple responses from other hosts on the same local network. Let's go to special IPv6 addresses. Uh, we mentioned colon colon, that is the unspecified address. There are certain protocols where when you're querying something, you don't know the IPv6 address answer yet, so you leave it all zeros, which is represented as colon colon and expands to all zeros. We have colon colon 1, which is the IPv6 loopback address on your loopback interface. It's useful for testing. Uh, if you're running a server and a client on, a, on, a, on the same computer and you want to test connectivity between them, using it, the loopback address is helpful. All IPv6 addresses starting with 2001 colon DB8 and then the rest of the range is, uh, and again we got a prepend here, zero, so it's 2001 colon 0 DB8 and then, and then the rest is reserved for the document, is documentation. And note I'm using a, what's called a prefix length here, what it's saying is, is 32 bits in, so we have 16 bits for the first hex tet and 16 bits for the second hextet. So every IPv6 address that starts with the first 32 bits matching 2001 0 DB8 um, is in the documentation prefix. What is the documentation prefix? Well, it's just a prefix that people can use for documentation, which is not used by anybody on the internet. You know, if you're, you're doing a training tutorial and you need to write down some IPv6 addresses, you should use the documentation prefix. Globally unique allocations, all IPv6 addresses starting where the first three bits match, uh, 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 match, well, let's convert this two to binary. The two in binary is zero, zero, one, zero. So if the first three bits are zero, zero, one, then that is what's called a unique allocation. Those are IPv6 addresses that are being allocated to unique universities, unique companies, 
unique internet service providers, unique homes. And the IPv6 addresses starting with 0, 0, 1, well, it could be 0, 0, 1, 0, which is 2, or it could be 0, 0, 1, 1, which is 3. So all globally unique IPv6 allocations so far start with the hex digits 2 or 3. There's unique local, which start with the first seven digits matching FC or FD, because the, the eighth bit could be one, which would increase the C from, you know, from 12 to 13. So if, if you see an IPv6 address where the first two hex digits are FC or FD, that is what's called unique local. And that is uh, similar to RFC 1918 address space uh, in IPv6. It is, uh, it is private address space. You can't route it on the internet. Um, but what's different about it is it's, uh, when you allocate it, you're supposed to set a whole bunch of, you're, you get an, you're supposed to set a whole bunch of bits randomly. So it's likely, even though you're not going to a, an authority to get these IPv6 addresses, they are likely to be unique just for you. And so if your company merges with another company, their unique local address range will likely be different from yours. So you won't have an overlap. Whereas if you have two large enterprises merge in their IPv4 address space, company A is using 10 net, company B is using IPv4 addresses also starting with 10. They overlap, so the merger, it's, it's, it's a real annoyance as a network engineer when you're merging two companies and you're using overlapping IPv4 addresses. So, FE80, uh, if the first 10 bits match FE80, and then, and then you know, that's, um, then that would be, well, I mean, F is four bits, E is four bits, eight is one zero. So if the first 10 bits match FE and then, and then, one zero that is link local unicast and that is ipv6 addresses on the local link and what that means is even if you don't have an internet router i mean you you bring up an interface to a switch uh you don't have any server out there you don't have any router giving you a a routable ipv6 address you can still bring up your own link local unicast address and possibly communicate with other hosts on the same local net, even though you can't route. There's an old site local, which is, you know, also similar to the old RFC 1918 address space, except it was not unique. And they figured out, hey, it's better to uh, have some random bits and, and pick a unique prefix as opposed to everybody using the same prefix. Multicast, IPv6 multicast. All IPv6 addresses starting with FF, where the first eight bits are FF, so the first eight bits are all one, they are all IPv6 multicast. And that means that's another case where you can send a packet uh, to one IPv6 destination address starting with FF, and the packet may arrive on multiple hosts. And that is used for certain types of network protocols such as printing. And then we have uh, IPv4 mapped IPv6 address. Well, if you have an IPv6 address all starting with all zeros, and then you have FFFF, and then the last 32 bits are displayed as if it was an IPv4 address, that is an IPv4, it, it is an IPv6 address corresponding to this IPv4 address. And so it is, um, uh, that is, that's just a way of displaying it. The way you know it's an IPv4 mapped IPv6 address is the first 96 bits are all zeros. And then, and then you got 16 bits of one, and then you have 32 bits left for the host. And that is used for, uh, IPv4 to IPv6, uh, transitions. And, uh, sometimes you'll see addresses displayed that way when you're programming uh, using sockets and you're trying to make your socket work on IPv4 and IPv6. And that's particularly true on Windows and there's a good chance you'll run into that. So if you run into an IPv6 address with 
you know, it looks like colons and at the end it looks like an IPv4 address. Well, it is an IPv6 address, uh, but it represents an IPv4 address and it's, it, it, it's to enable translation between IPv4 and IPv6 during the migration. You know, we listed special addresses at layer three for IPv4 and IPv6. There are also special MAC addresses at layer two. There's an there's a range of MAC addresses which correspond to IPv4 multicast addresses, and they all start with 01 colon 00 colon 5e, and then the next bit is zero, which gives you a range from zero to seven in the next uh, in the next uh, hex digit. There's a set of MAC addresses which are used for IPv6 multicast, and they all start with 3333. So that's easy. And then there's a special broadcast MAC address, which is all, it's all ones in binary, all Fs in a hexadecimal. It is, uh, uh, if, you, if you send a frame to this, uh, uh, to the MAC address all ones in binary, then every network interface card on that, uh, uh, on that ethernet will propagate that frame up to the CPU for processing. The story so far. The physical layer carries bits. The link layer treats those bits as a frame. We decode the layer 2 frame. We get a destination MAC address, a source MAC address, a payload type, and then we get the payload itself, which is a network layer payload, a packet. The layer three packet could be IPv4, it could be IPv6, it could be ARP, or it could be another layer three protocol. Packets include source IP addresses, destination IP addresses, payload type, and then the transport layer payload. The payload type could be TCP, it could be UDP, it could be ICMP. There's a bunch of other transport layer protocols that are less common, but they exist. Each layer serves a purpose, and each layer encapsulates the next layer. The physical layer's purpose is to carry bits. The link layer's purpose is for transporting over specific physical layers to adjacent hosts. And so the link layer has to deal with the characteristics of the physical layer. The network layer is for transporting independently of physical layers to the end host. So the link layer addresses are designed to, and the link layer addresses and the protocols are designed to deal with the, the specific physical layer. The network layer is designed to be independent of the physical layer. So that way you can use the same network layer on the whole internet. The network layer packets carry transport layer data, and then the transport layer carries data between applications. Let's look at some hop by hop address behavior. Here we have a host, which 1.1.1.1, which needs to talk to 1.1.2.3. And when it generates a packet, which is encapsulated in a frame, the, the frames, the, the destination IPv4 address of the packet is the end host, 1.1.2.3. However, the Ethernet frames destination is the MAC address of the next layer 3 hop. The frame's destination is not the MAC address of the switch that the frame switch the, the frame goes through. The 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 switch is is sort of designed to be transparent and and sort of tricks the network into replacing the bus. The 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 layer two destination address is the next layer three hop. And then this router updates, it receives the packet, and then it needs to send the packet on, it figures out it needs to forward the packet on. Uh, because using the destination address and so it knows that it needs to send it out another link layer interface which in this case also happens to be ethernet and so it 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 keeps the same layer 3 packet and the same layer 4 encoded information but the layer 2 frame changes it's a new layer 2 frame with a new source mac address 
and a new destination MAC address. And in fact, if this network was not Ethernet, if this network was another, like a cable network, then it might have a completely different layer two format with even possibly different layer two addressing. Might not even be a 48-bit address. However, in this case, it is an Ethernet address, and so the, the destination MAC address becomes the, the MAC address of the next layer three hop, which in this case happens to be the destination and host, the source MAC address is its own MAC address, but the source and destination IPv4 addresses have not changed because the network addresses are used end host to end host. Reiterating a bit, Ethernet addresses are used to get a frame to the next host on a local network, but IP addresses are used to route a packet to the destination through multiple local networks. Let's do another hop by hop address behavior example. In IPv6, we have a source host, 2001 colon DB8 colon 0 colon 1 colon colon 1, and it's communicating with end host 2001 colon DB8 colon 0 colon 2 colon colon 3. In this case, I've set it up so the the the, 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 the colon one is sort of the subnet. So here we have subnet one, here we have subnet two, uh, and the end host is a, a host on subnet two. So the, the source host creates its packet. The packet's destination is the destination IPv6 address, the, the subnet two colon colon three. However, that packet needs to, it, the source address is its own IPv6 address, subnet one, colon, colon, one. And the host encapsulates it in an Ethernet frame. The Ethernet frame, the source MAC address of the Ethernet frame is all A's. The destination MAC address of the Ethernet frame is the next layer three hop. Not the switch that it's going through, but the, the next router that it has to go to. The switch will see this frame. The switch will forward the frame out the correct switch interface based on the destination MAC address of the frame, and the frame will arrive at the intermediate router. The intermediate router will take, will, will remove the frame header, leaving the IPv6 packet, and it will keep the IPv6 packet intact, unchanged. It's still from subnet one host one to subnet two host three. However, it knows that it needs it it knows it needs to forward the packet on out another link layer interface. And so the next layer three hop is the actual destination, which is MAC address FFFF. So it creates a new layer two frame with its own MAC source address, with the end, the target MAC address as the destination. The IPv6 addresses in the packet have unchanged, and it forwards that onto the, this Ethernet segment. This Ethernet switch sees that the frame is destined to the FFFF host, and it forwards it out the correct interface for the FFF host. To, and then the destination host rece receives the frame, it decapsulates the IPv6 packet from the frame, and congratulations, we have gotten our IPv6 packet from our first host to our target host. Okay, I am host 1.1.2.3 and I just received a packet with data. Which application, which process should get that data? And the answer is we don't know from the destination IPv4 address. The destination IPv4 address is for the host. We need more information. In fact, we need another layer. So we have the transport layer. Here's our layer three IPv4 header. And included in the header is this field called protocol, which is this, it's actually eight bits. So it's this zero six hex digit here. And that indicates the layer four transport. In this case, um, transport protocol six is TCP, the transmission control protocol. And then we, we, 
after the source address and the destination IP address, the transport layer data starts at this C001. There are no options in this. There are no options in this packet header. In TCP, which is a layer four protocol, the a set of data is called a segment. So we have frames at layer two, we have packets at layer three, at layer four, for TCP specifically, it's called a segment. Another protocol is called UDP, which is a datagram. But for now, we're dealing with a TCP segment. TCP is protocol number six. So we're decapsulating our data from before. And we, at the end of the IPv4 header, we have the source uh, IPv4 address and the destination IPv4 address. And then our, our, our TCP segment starts here. We have a field, a source port field, which is 16 bits. And in 16 bits is four hexadecimal characters. That is C218 in hexadecimal. And then we have a destination port, which is 01BB in hexadecimal. So destination port is also 16 bits, 01BB in, in hexadecimal. If we convert 01BB in hexadecimal over to decimal, I believe that works out to 443, which you may be familiar with. That is the, the port for HTTPS, encrypted web traffic. And then there's a bunch of other information in the TCP segment header, which uh, deals with the protocol. We are going to cover TCP in in, in in detail, we'll have a full class on it later this term. But for now, you just need to know there's a source port and a destination port. Each one is 16 bits. So it's a range from zero to 65535 is the maximum possible uh, a source or a destination port in, in, uh, in TCP. UDP's, UDP also has 16-bit source and destination ports, so same range, 0 to 65535. And that port identifies the application that you need to talk to. So let's talk about a TCP, uh, I mean a network connection. There's a term called a five-tuple. A five-tuple uniquely defines a connection on the internet. Each end has an IP port combination, which is called a socket. So in effect, a, 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 a network connection is a five-tuple, which is two sockets. You have a socket on one end and a socket on the other end, and then you have the connection that communicates between them. The, the protocol, which could be TCP or UDP, the source IP, IPv4 IP address, which could be IPv4 or IPv6, the source port, which is 16 bits, so a range from 0 to 65535. The destination IP address uh, could be IPv4 or IPv6. And then the destination port, also 0 to 65535. These five pieces of data is a five-tuple and uniquely defines a connection between two processes on two separate computers on the Internet. Here is a command which exists on Unix and I believe it also exists on Windows called netstat. Netstat dash A N. I want to print out so I want to print out all sockets, dash A, and I want to print them out in numerical format. And then I'm just piping it into more so I can I can read it. And it's printing out all the five tuples on my computer. So you can see here we have a IP version six, actually TCP over IPv6, and we have my local IPv6 address and it appended the port number and my foreign IPv6 address and then the port number. You can see the foreign IPv6 address, uh, I'm sorry, the foreign port number is 443. So that is HTTPS. So this is a, um, uh, this is a, a web encrypted web traffic and the state is established. Uh, in the second line, we have TCP running over IPv4, and we have our local address, which is an IPv4 address, and our local port, our foreign address, uh, uh, which is a uh, an IPv4 address, and then the the remote port 993, which I believe is email related, and the state is established. And then if we scroll down near the bottom, you can see here we have one where we are, 
our local address uh, and it's a star which means any address on the local host and 49753 so it's a a it's a port it's tcp it's listening on tcp over ipv6 and tcp over ipv4 and the state is listening so this is this is a socket that is listening for inbound connections and i was curious about this so at least on unix ah yes i'm sorry uh, port 993 is imap which is email related um, so 49753 i was curious about this on unix there's lsof which lists open uh, uh, lists open files uh, and then i included uh, uh, the port 49753 and I found I was able to determine that process ID 366 which is uh, report D is the name of the application is listening on those TCP ports so here's an example how we can use the netstat command to see all open sockets all open outbound sockets all established inbound sockets and any sockets which are listening for inbound connections and then at least on unix if you have the lsof command you can narrow it down and identify the corresponding process let's go over a few more protocols we've already seen the tcp segment header which has a 16-bit source port and a 16-bit destination port and it has a bunch of other fields which allow uh, connections and it allows acknowledgments, which allows reliable transmission. So if data is lost in transit, TCP will detect that and, and, and resend the data. UDP is our other main transport layer protocol. And it also has a 16-bit source port and a 16-bit destination port. However, it does not have uh, anything to prevent lossage of data. So when you send a datagram over UDP, if it doesn't get there, it doesn't get there. There are no acknowledgments. So both TCP and UDP, uh, the, the, the headers are followed by data, which is delivered to the application. You should think of the port as an address on the host, identifying which process gets the data. TCP includes sequence and acknowledgement fields, allowing detection and retransmission of errors. So TCP is designed to be as reliable as possible. UDP does not detect dropped or duplicated data. Your application has to handle that. TCP sockets are connection oriented. This means that th this enables keeping track of acknowledgements, but what it means is when you're creating a TCP socket, you, you, you create a connection to another to a particular port on another host and all the data that you put into the socket gets to that host. UDP is different. In UDP you can you can create a UDP socket on a local host and then each time you send a datagram you can send it to a different target IP uh, different target address and a different target port. Um, you can sort of span out data uh, uh, that way. ICMP is the Internet Control Message Protocol it's transport protocol number one, so it's even ahead of TCP. It's used for diagnosing and reporting errors at the network layer. So it's used by ping. It's used by IPv6 for neighbor discovery and auto configuration. And it's a diagnostic protocol. DNS is the domain name service. It is used to map a host name to an IP address. A records map ho a host to an IPv4 address. Quad A records map a host to an IPv6 address. A C name is an alias, mapping an alias host name to a canonical host name. Here's an example where I use the host command to look up the DNS information for www.ietf.org. And it says it's a C name, which is an alias for www.ietf.org.cdn.cloudfailure.net. So they're using a content delivery network. And then the host command went ahead and looked up the 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 A records and the quad A records for this this CDN host, and it found two A records, so two IPv4 addresses, and two quad A records, two IPv6 addresses. So if you need to make a connection to www.ietf.org, there's a total of four remote IP addresses that you may connect to. Summarizing. We have layers, the physical layer, copper, fiber, 
spectrum. Its purpose is to deliver bits. Electrical engineers figure out how to encode bits onto that particular physical layer. We have the link layer, uh, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, cable to access. These deliver frames to between directly connected hosts. We have the network layer, IPv4, IPv6, and then there are other historic protocols. These deliver packets to the destination host and are independent of any particular physical layer. And then we have the transport layers, ICMP, TCP, UDP. Uh, TCP and UDP deliver data to applications. ICMP is, is also a transport layer protocol, but it is mostly a diagnostic protocol. We have addresses at each layer. Our Mac Ethernet hardware addresses are 48 bits. Um, and we have an example. The different layer twos may have different formats for hardware addresses. All the examples I've had so far have been 48 bits, but there are other layer twos that have different, uh, uh, different formats. Layer three, IPv in layer three, we have IPv4 addresses, which are 32 bits. We have IPv6 addresses, which are 128 bits. We have our shortening rules and our lengthening rules for IPv6. So we can get rid of leading zeros and make our addresses a little bit smaller. And in a few cases, like the loopback address, a lot smaller, because that would be colon colon one. At layer four, we have TCP or UDP ports, which are each 16 bits. So they range from zero to 65535. And port 443 is an example that we commonly use. And then we, ha we have a host name, which is www.usb.edu is an example of a host name. And you use DNS to map it to an IP address because humans use host names, but, computer, but computers and networks use IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. So the domain name service protocol maps the convenient host name to the IP address. Please look at the canvas. We, in a typical week, we have reading assignments, we have uh, programming labs, and our first lab is Monday, so make sure to bring the lab book. We have practice quizzes, which are open internet book and notes, and when you're doing a practice quiz, uh, if you don't know the answer to something, look it up and learn it. And then we have graded quizzes, which cover, which are closed internet book and notes. They're timed, they're one attempt, and they cover material similar to the practice quizzes. Uh, but they're shorter. We have written homework and we have programming homework. So check the canvas. And that is it.